As business owners, entrepreneurs, family men, it's difficult for us to find the time to put together projects like these. Even though it's something we really want to do, unfortunately, taking care of the things we have to take care of comes first. However, because of viewer support for people like you, we're able to continue doing this. Please consider joining our Patreon and supporting the Burn and Return podcast. to Burn and Return, a weekly one-hour podcast covering news from the agricultural and turf grass industries. Welcome everyone to episode 13 of Burn and Smurf and Return. I am going to be your host. My name is Matt. Sometimes I go by the Grass Factor. My and, and along with me today, we have my two lovely cohorts, my brothers in crime. If we had to share a jail cell together, we would come out of there feeling just actually hotly satisfied that we got to hang out with one another, regardless of it being jail and regardless of dropping the soap. I want to introduce Mr. Ryan DeMay, Mr. Ray Edo. Ryan, how are you doing today, sir? You piqued my anxiety there a little bit when you talked about coming inside of a jail cell. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, I'm doing very good <laughs> right now. I'm doing very, very good. And um, looking forward. Hey, it's it's of a different night, right, that we're doing this on than we normally do, right? So if you don't know when we're doing this, go ahead and subscribe to www.patreon.com forward slash burn and return right because you can see this live as it takes place help us even pick up the show title if you want right boys all for the price of what airport beer you know maybe maybe we're getting up into about an airport mixed drink here i don't know what do you think ray it's starting to get a little expensive out there i i think so i think this is going to be worse like at least uh airport margarita or uh, bloody mary Ooh, yeah. <laughs> that's what i'm thinking yep. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> no, no, guys, guys, hang on. Let me interrupt <laughs> you right there. Do you know what it is to get in at the Discord? I, I mean, to to get into the to the patron, you get three different. Wait on me. You can do you can do a four dollar option, right? Which you can't mm -hmm. even buy a beer for four bucks, right? You just you can't you can't buy one at the airport. You you could at the Seven Eleven. You could get right. You could get a chubby of Miller High Life. By the way. Does nope. anybody know what a chubby of Miller High Life is? I, I'm not familiar with this term. They are the 32 ounce cans. They're they, they are they're nicknamed chubbies, and uh, and so all right. Back when I was in college, we would play a game called uh, Edward Forty Hands, and yeah, that would be Edward where you would hands. tape you know 40 ounce beers to your hands. Um, well. After college, we grew up, graduated, and we started playing Edward Chubby Hands, and that was where we would tape the 32-ounce Miller High Life Chubbies to our hands. I think they're going for like $2.99 each right now. So, you know, yeah. that's, what, that's what you're supporting us with is a 32-ounce Edward Chubby Hand experience right here. For 10 bucks, for 10 bucks, now we're talking about an airport beer, maybe an airport uh, a drink you know if you did like a shot of jack daniels you'd probably get that for for 10 bucks if you wanted to get into the mixed drink territory it'd be the 20 bucks the real zone and then so i mean really it's not that expensive if you think <laughs> that. i don't see anything it's got astronomical there no yeah that being said ray sir how are you doing this evening <laughs> No, I'm doing good. I'm doing doing great. Uh, let's see, just having a very uh, lazy and quiet uh, Saturday afternoon uh, because uh, I got word uh, from the freight company that apparently my mower is deliverable uh, next week. Uh, it is not Ooh. caught up in the uh, fuster cluck uh, known as the uh, shipping apocalypse. Hey, thank God. And I can't wait to get into this because we are going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the foundational issues related to that in today's episode, um, because all of that plays into fertilizer prices and all that fun stuff. So 
Uh, before we do it right now, just blow it all out of the water. Let's do, go ahead and jump into the headlines. Nothing to fear here. This is just the news. Gentlemen, we're going to kick this off with article number one here. And the headline from TurfNet, which is a very, if you do not subscribe to TurfNet, go do it. Just, just do it. Support everybody involved, and uh, you know if you really want some information from the uh, the turfgrass community, the professional side of the turfgrass community, this is a great place to start. California jury sides with Bayer in Roundup cancer case. Bayer won its first court decision amid a seemingly endless trail of allegations that its non-selective herbicide Roundup is blamed for causing cancer in thousands of litigants. In a decision that left both sides claiming victory, a Los Angeles jury ruled against plaintiff Destiny Clark, who claimed that Roundup was to blame for Burkitt's lymphoma that killed her son, Ezra. Attorney said October 5th, according to court documents, Ezra Clark was four years old when he was diagnosed in 2016 with Burkitt's lymphoma, a rare form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Destiny Clark said her son often accompanied her when she applied Roundup to the family residence. She sued Bayer for failing to adequately warn her of the cancer risk associated with using glyphosate, the active ingredient, in Roundup. Uh, Bayer uh, bought Roundup uh, from Monsanto in 63 mil. Well, really, Bayer bought Man Monsanto uh, more so, uh, but included in that was a $63 million deal that gave them access to the glyphosate compound. And they've settled more than 100,000 of those cases for $11 billion and have another $4.5 billion for potential future settlements. But here, gentlemen, here, for whatever reason, in the midst of this trial, they did not feel like there was enough evidence to award her compensation for the death of her four-year-old, which is horrific. I can't stress that enough. That is yeah. horrific. I can't imagine what that family had to go through. And uh, I don't know. Well, tell me, <laughs> gentlemen, what is y'all's take on it? You know, here again, there's there's another pending thirty thousand cases out there, right? They settled a hundred thousand, still thirty thousand out there, right? So, you know, I don't know how the the money breaks down, but if you just do the math on that, that's a hundred and ten thousand to each case. I'm assuming each one's a plaintiff. I don't know if that was class action or how that was, but any anyway, like, it sort of feels, you know, a little bit like. You know, the mesothelioma commercials you see late at night, like, you know, if you or your loved one have been affected. Uh, I think you, you've you gotten to this point, right, where there are the uh, commodity ambulance chasers that are circling here with some of this stuff. And <clears throat> unfortunately, th these are people that have either gotten sick or have passed away. And that that is a terrible thing. Don't get me wrong. Can we directly attribute it, though, to their their use or their exposure or whatever to this particular chemical i don't think you can i, I it, it's there's so much out there in terms of actual published research that shows that is not um a direct cause necessarily right but there are some links to it and things like that but ray you correct me if i'm wrong here but the body of evidence is pretty strong uh in terms of its carcinogenic effects you know, you, Ryan, you just said it uh, and hit it out of the park right there because the evidence, actual evidence suggests that glyphosate is not a cancer or health risk otherwise. And anecdotally, I've known people that handled Roundup or glyphosate when it first uh, hit the market in the early 1980s. and last i heard is all of those people have since passed from something other than cancer so in my mind glyphosate is not it and i might i might want to add something to that little uh to that particular case where this woman is claiming that glyphosate caused cancer in her son uh and this is my, my question. Lady, what the hell are you doing allowing your yeah. kid to follow you around while you're spraying? I mean, what are you thinking? I mean, 
<laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, that is that is something too that at what you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't I have problems with it. I mean, that, that, even that, that think that, that somebody thinks that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, an yeah, interesting I mean, that just gives me anxiety from this article that says ninety percent of all the lawsuits have originated from the consumer market. Ninety percent. If there was ever uh, a, 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 a motivating factor to remove this product from the consumer market, what would it be? It would be the fact that 90% of all their lawsuits are coming from it, right? Am I right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that gets passed down among all of those that use it responsibly and all of those that don't use it responsibly. That gets passed down to the people that pour it out in... Uh, a, a designated area or the people that pour it down a storm drain. It just is, it's a matter of fact that when, when these things become highly publicly scrutinized and available, accessible, um, you know, it's, it's a, it, it puts everyone in a, in a very risky situation if they rely on this as a tool in the toolbox. But again, I just want to reiterate I, I, victory in this sense is a very difficult word for me to use. I don't want to use the word victory here because it, we're also talking about the death of a four-year-old, and I do think that's insensitive. And um, and there's there's nothing victorious about the death of a four-year-old. It's absolutely horrific. And again, what I've said before and what I will reiterate now is that when people experience this massive amount of tragedy that's unexplainable, they need something to rely on to help them to, to prop up, to explain why they had to experience such tragedy. And it's easy to point at something like glyphosate as, as a scapegoat. So um, I, I just, I couldn't be any more devastated for the Clark family. I think that's hor horrific, absolutely horrific. And, uh, and I, I hope they find peace and tranquility and uh, and, and hopefully are able to continue on with their life in a, in a positive and meaningful way. However, on yes. to our next topic of conversation here. Dum, dum, dum. Gentlemen, fertilizer index hits record, threatening higher food prices. Uh, this is a very, very gentle article from Bloomberg right here. Uh, because Bloomberg is, <laughs> is, uh, is, is not necessarily uh, too keen on just all out, flat out, frightening people. Uh, on, I'm not even going to go there. Let me read. A gauge of North American fertilizer prices soared to a record high, driving up costs for farmers and threatening to worsen food inflation. Green markets, which is, let me explain what green markets is. Green markets is a division of Bloomberg that uh, 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 calibrates, for lack of a better word, Fertilizer prices across the entirety of the industry. And so the majority of commodity brokers, commodity traders, uh, traders base all of their pricing off of the green markets report. It is the industry standard in bulk fertilizer commodity sales. Green markets North America fertilizer price index rose another 7.9% from the beginning of this week to the end of the week, which was already up 11%. To $996.32 per short ton, soaring past the 2008 peak and set a new benchmark for the index that began in January of 2002. The fertilizer market has been hit hard this year due to extreme weather, eh, plant shutdowns, sanctions, and rising energy costs in Europe and China, pushing prices past levels that traders and farmers hadn't seen since the global financial crisis. The energy squeeze in Europe and Asia has created a critical situation for the fertilizer industry, according to the biggest manufacturer in Hungary. And we have some more information on this with the largest fertilizer manufacturer in Europe altogether, that being Yara, who also has a very large presence in the United States, has shut down fertilizer production due to the cost of producing actually ammonia. At commodity prices this high, there's no way for them to be able to produce ammonia and generate a profit. So you know what they did? They halted. So 
a little bit further into that, a little bit further into that, what they did start doing is importing ammonia or natural gas from the United States and other surrounding areas to be able to resume production, to be able to feed the European market. However, they will not be feeding any of their materials into the U.S. market, at least for the next foreseeable future until prices tend to stabilize. So what that means is that not only are they putting pressure on our natural gas uh, costs, they are also putting pressure on our uh, our nitrogen supply here in the United States and is thus creating this gigantic, oh, huge, and they're not the only sole reason. Uh, we are already in a natural gas tightening. There's been a lot of uh, restrictions put on that industry with the change of administrations. And I'm not going to say that's right or wrong, but I'm just saying that's, that's what happened. And with the pressure that's come from it, we are seeing rising in natural gas prices, which is the dominant uh, uh, active ingredient used for the production of ammonia, and ammonia being the primary active ingredient used for the production of urea. And so that, that is why we're seeing nitrogen prices uh, skyrocket. Um, and to be honest, we are relatively shielded compared to what we're seeing from uh, Europe right now, which is up 500% in natural gas cost. 500%. We're up 100%. They're up 500%. And here's the unfortunate fact of the thing. If we have a colder than predicted winter, and what is effectively being budgeted for right now is a 1% colder winter than we had last year. If we exceed that 1% colder winter, uh, then there is likely that we could see doubling of natural gas. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. Did I say doubling? I meant uh, upwards of 4x. 4x natural gas prices we see right now, which would oh. put us into <clears throat> double digit natural gas prices. We're at $3 right now. That would put us over 10. And if that goes up that much, we would see urea prices right now, predictably, uh, somewhere in the range of $2,000 a ton, if not greater. And gentlemen, if it hits that price, United States manufacturers of nitrogen would also shut down because it would be impossible to turn a profit off their production process. We are in the midst of what could potentially be one of the greatest uh, 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 issues. Uh, uh, I'm going to use the word crisis liberally here, uh, but a potential. We're not there yet, but the, the, the building blocks are all in place. And if this does strike, food prices, we're not just going to see a little bit of inflation. We're not talking about 10, 15% inflation on food prices. We're going to see monumental increases in food prices. If fertilizer increases, which are already up by 3x since this time last year, 3x. We've gone from 300 a ton now to 900, in, uh, now to 1,000 a ton. We're up over 3x. If you don't think that will not be passed on to the consumer in terms of the cost of food, you have lost your MF in mind. Gentlemen, I am in. I was talking about before the show, my anxiety being high. It was because of the research I did in, in this space right here. I am genuinely freaked the F out. Well, okay. I'm, I'm a bit freaked out too. And not in the sense of not being able to cover prices or, but so more in the space of, is this going to mean that next time I put in an order, uh, I'm going to be told, uh, sorry, that product's just not available. It's on back order and we don't know when we're getting anymore because all of the plants that make these specialty products are all shut down. And I'm speaking beyond just, uh, you know, Yara products because. All of these fertilizers have basic components or commodities in them, including urea, ammonium phosphate, and ammonium sulfate. So, and, and by the way, the reason why natural gas is so important to fertilizer production is because, Matt, are you familiar with the process by which Natural gas gets turned into ammonia. Uh, Haber Bosch. Haber Bosch. Yep, Haber Bosch, where air is catalytically reacted with 
natural gas. And what happens is the nitrogen recombines with the hydrogen in the natural gas to create ammonia gas. You know, that's like super important and it only works on a large scale. So you basically need shit tons of natural gas, you know, on hand and available. And, and to, to reiterate <laughs> and reinforce this, it, without Haber-Bosch, we would all be dead right now. There's no way the population could have supported the size we are at right now because food production never could have increased at the rate it increased. Haber-Bosch single-handedly has supported the growth of the population of the world up to this point. Single-handedly. So that, I, I want to stress the absolute importance of what Haber-Bosch is. And it has been improved and refined and increased efficiencies and all that. But what it did not prepare for is what we have run into now is where the cost of natural gas becomes cost prohibitive for the production of ammonia, which ultimately in turn affects the rate at which we can produce crops, which in turn affects our food supply. Demay, what do you think about this? Are, are, we, are we headed towards disaster? I'm freaked out about it. You're typically a voice of reason. Are you freaked out? Are you panicking yet? Not yet. I would agree that the, the way that this is shaking out is such that, again, the pieces are in place, but there are like, eight or nine really important things that have to happen right um some in sequence some not in sequence for us to get to that point right so i guess it's a few things right like, like at a macro level you know and this goes for you, you know logistics supply chain uh, you know everything where we're at right now here in 2021 is who is going to take responsibility right and i understand that some of this is is going to take time and all that kind of stuff and it's going to involve way bigger things than we could even dream up here on our little podcast but who is going to start to take control and own this shit in terms of starting to unfuck everything right and have a functioning you know commerce industry that you know is based in multiple different segments everything like that that isn't just like one thread away from yep the whole house of cards is gonna fall right so there's that piece i just i i, I don't know that we're there yet I, I agree that there's some things that need to happen in order and i just wonder what are we gonna do like what are we just gonna sit here and keep reacting to it right as opposed to coming up with something different something better whatever that is so i'm anxious to see what the path forward is there the last thing i'll say yeah, is this on a I micro am... level go ahead no oh, no ahead. you go ahead you go ahead i was gonna say on a, on a micro level if if you are a professional applicator you need to have a serious reckoning with yourself with your suppliers excuse me with the terms that you're on with them with those suppliers and starting to lock in some product for coming up next year like now and i understand if you don't have the cash and everything but if you don't lock in some of this product and don't get it you know on your shelf who's to say that you're going to have product next year and if you don't have product how much money are you going to have next year that's all i'm saying and that that is a great point right because we're not just running into the wall of saying that oh it's going to be more expensive next year that is a given you know, we talked about in the weeks past how a, a $10 bag of fertilizer all of a sudden this year became a $20 bag of fertilizer and going into next spring, maybe a $30 bag of fertilizer. That is here. That's done. Like, you, you're yeah, seeing was, it. Uh, yeah. These are prices that, and I have been talking about this all week and, and doing it in the Discord and, and, and having a panic attack about it all damn week about we are on the verge of shooting past 2008 prices. And here we did just yesterday at the market close. We, skip, we skyrocketed past 2008 prices. And boy, let me tell you, you're going to be in for one hell of a shock when you go to buy a bag of urea. And, and I'm saying this from a per, per professional perspective. 
When you go to buy your first round urea and dissolve it into your tank and where you were used to paying $15 a bag and now it's costing $40 a bag, you are going to shit a brick and rightfully so. I 100% agree with you that you should shit a brick. Here's the real situation though. If we do have a hard winter, it's not a matter of a $40 bag of urea now. It's, is there even a bag of urea available? And that is, we are, we are on the line that these are the types of conversations you have to start having now with your suppliers and your distributors. It's no longer like, you know, hey, can you help me out on price? We're beyond that. We've already hit that. We're there. We're, we're, we, have, we have thrusted through that line. The conversation is now that if nitrogen goes on a restricted production, can you guarantee me I have X number of tons of urea available? Because we're moving into the territory of it not being available. And let's go ahead and shoot a little bit of gasoline on the fire right now, since we're already on the topic of it. And our next headline here is plan now for the herbicide shortages of 2022. This is from Cotton Grower, but is also posted in every other crop production magazine that is out there. Retailers and the basic suppliers are all very concerned about herbicide shortages in 2022. We all can recall similar concerns this past spring. In most cases, applicators were able to get what they needed. However, this spring, retailers were often able to fill shortages by accessing carryover from 2020. I've been told there will be no carryover or herbicides to fill holes in 2022, so the probability of herbicides not being available is much more likely. The two herbicides everyone is pointing to that will most likely run short especially in Tennessee, are glyphosate and glufosinate. Several retailers have said they're only being allocated at best 80% of what glyphosate and glufosinate they sold in 2021. 80% of what they sold in 2021. Moreover, delivery of the herbicides may not occur until July in some cases. As oh, such, here's some thoughts on how to effectively stretch it, and they give some ideas here based on the active ingredients. Unfortunately, there will not be a good herbicide substitute for glufosinate. There's just not. And there's also not really uh, your only uh, uh, replacement for glyphosate is glufosinate. Gentlemen, if you don't know how the herbicide market works, it works primarily like this. The majority of the active ingredients we use in the United States is produced in China. Our bulk manufacturers here in the United States will produce it overseas, import it into the United States where it goes through its final formulation, right? So you'll have a series of raw ingredients and then they'll uh, uh, either dissolve it into liquids, add the various herbicide carriers, uh, emulsification agents, whatever it is they add that it makes the secret sauce out of those active ingredients, and then bottle it here in the United States to shave on, save on that piece of it. However, the raw materials come from overseas. If you're not aware of what's going on in the shipping market right now, we have hundreds and thousands of vessels sitting off the coast of the United States right now because we don't have enough workforce to even unload the boats that are sitting out there. So typically, the United States has never had to run a 24-7 port system. Well, we are at the point right now that even if we did run 24-7, we couldn't unload everything in an effective manner. We would still be backed up all the way to July if we started running 24-7. But we don't run 24-7, and we're so short on, on staff right now. And I'll give you an example that one of our manufacturers we work with, they're running at a 25% reduced capacity at all times because either someone has been exposed to COVID or they're currently suffering from COVID. And I'm not going to turn this into a, well, they should do that, they should do that. It has nothing to do with that. My case in point being is that we can't get material offloaded in time to get it here. We're struggling with the whole import process. So... If we're already backed up till July, and no lie, that's what I was quoted was that if they shipped right now, it would not unload in the United States till July. If we are truly indeed backed up that long, holy shit, we are entering a whole new world of fuckery. <clears throat> fuckery. And I'm sorry for the bad words there, but I, 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 I think the doubling down between Fuck. the potential of actually running into nitrogen Fuck. shortages and now herbicide shortages this is crazy is this, i mean this is crazy how is this going to affect food prices we know fertilizer accounts for 15 to 20 percent of food cost what does herbicide account for in food production what does herbicide account for in terms of return on investment yield per dollar spent right this is complete and total chaos why is this not front and center of every Major news outlet right now because this is a very well, well. Actually, I'm glad it's not because the crazy people would go absolutely nuts. I'm hey, one of them, listen, and you see me going nuts. 
Now listen, yeah. you can you can agree, disagree, whatever, right, with what's happened over the last, you know, whatever, uh seven, nineteen months, right, since COVID. But I could I could say unequivocally, right, that Besides public health being one of the things that was most taken for granted of, granted of in the society, society, right? That um, agriculture and and food production has got to be right there neck and neck, one A, one B. I mean, people show up at Kroger or Safeway or wherever the fuck you shop and expect everything to be on the shelves. And I can't tell you how many times here I've I've seen people. Well, there's 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 nothing on the shelves i don't get it i don't understand and it's like what you're saying matt like do you really understand what's going on in society at large right and it's not like that uh people are doing a bad job at the at the ground level like we just don't have the tools right and the resources to either bring products to market get raw materials to manufacturers that are going to get into the people that are going to actually put them in their hands right the end users and to me i don't know i you know i i I don't really know how this ends now you got my anxiety going because how do you take how do you take control of that you start making everything over here what it costs go up how long does it take to mobilize that kind of effort like and i'm not like a you know a nationalist and all this other kind of shit like it's I just am. more of like we hey i get it i'm not saying that i i i, I, love I am USA too and everything but i'm I'm, 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 a, I'm a u.s manufacturer so i'm i i play favoritism here right and that's, that's i'm gonna say, say this that. i'm gonna say this is how then all this vc money all this other stuff that we talk about for uh the freaking you know the co2 capture thing in iceland i'm not denying that climate change is in you know a big a big thing that we need to take care of all this kind of stuff but man there are some very prescient issues right on the horizon that probably dwarf probably dwarf what might happen right and you, you want to know uh, you want to know what the issue is in this space ryan i'll tell you right now investment money in the manufacturing sector is not sexy the mm-hmm. real money out there wants a piece of things that are going to give them a 10x return on their investment in three years that is the name mm-hmm. of the game that is the and when you build your pitch deck, that's what you have to show your three year game plan on how you're going to get your investors a 10x uh, uh, a return on their investment. Right. In manufacturing, you're playing economy of scale. It's not sexy. There are no 10x margins in manufacturing that does not exist. Therefore, the investment dollars are not placed into this sector to be able to scale and produce in quantity. So when it comes time to mobilizing and being able to bring these things in internally to become independent, to become manufacturing independent, the money is not there. You can't do it. You have to literally bootstrap your ass up or convince some suckers from Singapore that you've got a phenomenal idea to only have them take it away from you. I'm not crying. You're crying. But you you mm-hmm. can't. You have to bootstrap it. and pick up a dollar or two here and there you gotta lie cheat steal whatever is necessary in order to bring it up to scale it's not sexy no one wants to invest in it therefore it's not going to take place here until there's real uh, uh nationalistic strategy employed here and and i and i i i don't mean that in the sense of, of nationalism like f the world kind of thing but what i'm saying yeah. is that we have to it has to be internally focused uh, uh, a a national strategy to invest in manufacturing and internal logistics and even uh, 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 logistics that move from other countries into the United States. We have to own that logistical piece and we don't right now. And and that now when we get hit with this and we get in the midst of a a pandemic, you said 19 months, it's actually 22 months. I've been following this since January of of the outbreak when it was coming out in, uh, in China there because I'm a weirdo, I'm an absolute nutcase. And have been stalking it since then. So, my my point my point being is we are in. This is a weird. This is weird. I'm freaked out. I didn't mean I, to cut you. You know what? There. I'm sorry. No, I, I'm really freaked out too because you want to talk about all of the crazies. You know what's happening right now is literally following the playbook of the global 
elitists. And when I say the global elitists, I'm talking about all of the anti-technology, anti-progress, anti-agriculture activists who literally think everybody else should be living in caves and eating bark for dinner. This just falls in Tech, because... Uh, I thought Ted Kaczynski was in jail. Oh. No, no, no. You see, there's all of these other organizations and people, like, you know, all of these people that uh, say lawns are bad, uh, you know, plant flowers. That is just a representation of that element. Because in actual practice, those are the same people that say modern, you know, high productivity agriculture is bad. Manufacturing is bad. You know, they want to take us all back to the Flintstone days. And then we talked about the Flintstones the other night. Okay, never mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we're, we've been being this to death. We need to move on. but. I, you know, my, my point, mm. if I haven't stressed it enough, I think I have, I think I've, I've given everybody anxiety up to this point, but it is, it's a real thing. Pay attention to it, read about it, you know, maybe make what if preparations. I'm not saying go and stock up on, you know, freaking MREs from, uh, uh, whatever that church guy is that sells the buckets of food. You know who I'm talking about? Who is that guy? He went to jail what? at one point. Yeah, 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 yeah. The religious guy that did the buckets of food. Uh, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apocalypse yeah. Chow? Jim Baker. Do you know Jim Baker? B A K K E R? Oh, oh yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He went to jail for a long time and he he does buckets of food. I mean, I'm not saying do that, but if you if you haven't had these conversations, it's it's time to pay attention to it at least. I'm not I'm not anyway. I digress. I'm okay. Hey, but, I mean, because in, you know, in this pandemic, I've already been hit by basic like scarcities uh, because remember my crisis back in April of 2020, my crisis was not fertilizer. My crisis was not herbicides back then. You know what my crisis was, Matt? Basic foodstuffs. Basic foodstuffs. Because I was literally freaking the frick out because I couldn't even get a hold of a five pound bag of unbleached flour or any kind of flour. And, you know, no more biscuits, no more pizza, <laughs> no more bread, uh, no more, no more uh, homemade uh, pasta carbonara. It's all, it was all over, you know. Listen, Ray, is a, <laughs> Ray, Ray is a growing boy and needs his homemade <laughs> carbs, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but that, you know, is something that's always looming in the back of my mind. And of course, what's hitting right now is all of the pre-packaged and pre-made stuff is actually hit rather hard and doesn't bother me because, uh, you know, I eat everything fresh. But for other people, uh, the freezer section in the supermarkets is kind of bare. Right? And the shelves are bare too. But exactly what Matt's talking about because there's a problem with getting food from the farm to the processing facilities and then back out onto the store shelves. I mean, we've had this problem, you know, going on, what is that, 18 months now? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, somebody said, you know, projected meat shortages. Uh, uh, yeah, because it depends on how much uh, crop production for feed uh, takes place too, 
right? So all of these things are to be taken into consideration. And all of that will be affected because remember, not only do we have to eat, animals have to eat, and that's what keeps more food on our plates. You know, our diets do not primarily consist of just corn and soybean, like you see growing everywhere. A lot of that corn and soybean goes towards meat production, which we then in turn consume. All right, moving on, gentlemen. Clover growth in Mars-like soils boosted by bacterial symbiosis. This is a study here out of ScienceDaily.com. Clover plants grown in Mars-like soils experience significantly more growth when inoculated with symbiotic nitrogen-fixing bacteria than when left uninoculated. That was discovered here at a Colorado State University. As Earth's population grows, researchers are studying how possibility of farming Martian soils or regolith, uh, or, or uh, the possibility, uh, yeah, whatever. However, regolith is lacking in some essential plant nutrients, including certain nitrogen-containing molecules uh, that plants require to live. Therefore, agriculture on Mars will require strategies to increase the amount of these nitrogen compounds in regolith. However, what they found is that bacteria could play a cost-effective role in making Martian soils more fertile. On Earth, bacteria in soils can help convert or fix atmospheric nitrogen into the molecules that plants need. Some of these microbes have symbiotic relationships with plants, aka things you know that produce, you know, we think of like nodules and stuff, in which they fix nitrogen within nodules found on plant roots. To explore a possible role for symbiotic nitrogen fixing bacteria in, in astro agriculture, the researchers grew clover and man made regolith that closely matches that of Mars and saw a positive interaction there. So, gentlemen, if the fit hits the shan here on planet Earth, make good with your local friend. A, uh, a la Elon Musk and uh, sign up to be in one of those rockets that go out there because this is a very real thing for those of you that are interested in this whole quest of of, of Mars colonization and you know I took my son to Huntsville Alabama to uh, go to the Space and Rocket Museum and I talked to uh, one of the uh, original engineers for the Apollo project and um in the midst of conversation, he was talking about how he was actually a chemical engineer. And so we had kind of conversations related to chemistry and he encouraged me. He said, if you do indeed grow plants, you should take a look at the existing research that's taken place. And if it's something that you feel inspired to do and you do continue and, and you care to continue the strategy of the United States of becoming a multiplanetary species, then you should play your part and try to see if there's anything you can unpack about being able to grow plants in uh, in extraterrestrial uh, space. So I think it's interesting here. What we come to find out is that there is, and this is stuff we've all recognized in Earth, is that there's uh, symbiotic relationships between bacteria and plants uh, because that's what makes, you remember we talk about how oxides are mostly plant available and how, but if you do have adequate oxide levels in the soil, the plant will at least keep the plant from, uh, or the soil will at least keep the plant from showing major deficiencies because of microbial mineralization. And that is because of the relationship between plants and microbes that exist in the soil. So uh, interesting that you have to take a desolate place like that, add uh, some beneficial bacteria to it, or at least just get something growing on it that can help carry and colonize beneficial bacteria. And all of a sudden you've got a productive soil. What do you think, Ray? Do you want to grow plants in, uh, in, uh, in Martian soils? I do. I think it's cool. I do too. I, I do too, because although I'm going back to what we're talking about, how resource, resources are scarce, I'd imagine that we need a hell of a lot of resources to be able to do it in space. You know, it's uh, <laughs> because my focus would be, Matt, right now, is how do we optimize food production and food logistics right here, right now on uh, planet Earth? Or, uh, you know, or is this going to be the scenario of this movie that I saw when I was a kid that kind of freaked me out? Because you know what the plot of that movie was, Matt and Ryan? What's that? Okay. The, the the plot of this movie was that at age, I think, 39 or 40, people would start to be selected to be terminated. It's... Uh... <laughs> yeah. You know... It, 
I, I, I want to make a point here that I am uh, one, the privatization of anything really. I'm a gigantic fan. I'm a fan of, you know, I don't, I don't think it's any, any, any secret to this point that, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a fairly uh, staunch uh, libertarian, almost extremist libertarian. And, uh, and it's not to say that I disagree with anybody on either side of the aisle. I think there's positives and benefits to everything. Um, I, and, and so I'm, I'm definitely all encompassing of everybody's ideas. You know, I, I'm, I'm not hardlined anything, but uh, that, that being said, my, my point is with the privatization of everything, including space flight and, uh, a, a multi planetary, uh, establishment, especially for the human race. And I, I think it's a phenomenal idea. And the fact that someone like Elon Musk could dream it and build it comes to show the resiliency of the human race. And if that is on the menu, which at this point it is, I mean, if you're not aware of it, <laughs> go watch a SpaceX video. <laughs> like we, we are headed that direction. And if you believe in the American dream, if you believe in the, hum the dream of humanity, my point is, is if you have these skill sets, and, and remember, there's lots of things that go along with this. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. Uh, hungry Southerner, we love you, but that's not all that's that's needed. Um, there are, are doctors that are needed out there. There are are um, agronomists that are needed out there. Uh, there are plant geneticists that are needed out there. And even from a cultural aspect, even you know, I, as as hard as I can be on liberal arts degrees, there's uh, an important piece of that too. Because you think about it, you got to think about the mental health of people that would be traveling for you know three months on a, a, a spaceship and to, to be able to make it there. I don't know why I'm so deep in this right now, right? Save me. Where am I going? I don't know. This is, this is too much. Your, an too deep. your anxiety from, from the realization that <laughs> fertilizer and agriculture as we know it uh, is in danger. <laughs> it's weird right now. It's weird. Um, with that, let's jump over to something more positive. Let's talk about this week's sponsor. This week's sponsor is Ryan Noor Lawn Care. Shout out to Ryan Noor and everything he does. We love uh, the, the, the production value in his content and also what he shares. You know, we got to say that uh, from our perspective, Ryan is the kind of guy that if he doesn't know the answer to something, he is very quick to reach out to the types of people where he can get that information. Whether that's taking a trip out to a seed producer in Oregon or jumping on a phone call with someone like Ryan DeMay. Check out, support Ryan Orr Lawn Care if you care to. This is a small business, really, really small business, and he's just doing what he's got to do to be able to get by. Uh, I personally helped design this product for him and his Midwest community right here, and this is called Grow or G. Nothing absolutely just phenomenally ex uh, 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 special about it other than the fact that it does contain EDDHA iron, which is a very uh, uh, seldom thing you've ever seen in the uh, granular fertilizer space. In fact, this is the only granular fertilizer on the market right now that I'm aware of that contains EDDHA iron. And to put our own special pin on it, uh, spin on it, we also put the root promoting peptides in there. And part of the renovation that we've been doing here in Knoxville is actually using this product to be able to monitor uh, the types of results we get from it. And we've got to say that, you know, in the absence of phosphorus, we've done some pretty incredible things. So if you care to support small businesses, you care to support the show, go check out Ryan Orr Lawn Care. And uh, if it fits your budget and it fits what you do, if you have high pH soils and you're out in the Midwest, maybe yeah, consider picking up a bag or go or do one of the other lawn supply company products. That being said, dum, 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 let's move into this week's Burnt. Sheila. Sheila. All right, gentlemen, we're going to start this off on a negative light because we have not talked about enough negative things today. Let's continue to pile <laughs> up the shit pile and just make sure everyone doesn't want to wake up tomorrow. 84-year-old Staples man killed in a lawnmower accident. This is out of Minneapolis. An 84-year-old man was killed in a lawnmower accident on Wednesday in Wadena County. According to the Wadena County Sheriff, he was found outside in a mowed field, and it looked as if he was working on a broken lawnmower when it backed up and pinned him to the ground. Authorities found him Wednesday at 7.20 a.m. It was unclear how long he had been outside. His name was Russell Shemp. Rest in peace, good sir. May the Lord oh, have mercy man. on your soul. Gentlemen, lawnmowers are dangerous whether we care to admit it or not. Thoughts? 
Oh, thoughts. Yes. Oh, I, 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 I didn't know that. Yeah. Yes. My bad. My fault. My <laughs> yes. Bad. Yeah, a- absolutely. Uh, I thought that was a dramatic pause. You, you, you started doing that a long time ago, and then you stopped, and now you're back into a period of dramatic pauses again. I <laughs> think. So, hey. Not T-H-O-T. <laughs> That's a good one, Jay Pink. I stole your name. <laughs> Um, I feel this is, this sounds, we're sociopaths here talking about this poor old man dying under a lawnmower. Um, hey, right. It's the same thing, right? Like, do not, do not become complacent, right? There's an old saying, old saying, right? Complacency always comes to collect, right? And hey, maybe you're 84 years old, you forget about something, you you thought it was good, and maybe it wasn't, but uh, I don't know. It's it's unfortunate, and I hopefully this calls attention to everybody else that's working on their stuff, because I know we got a lot of people that watch us, whether they're pros or homeowners or DIYers or whatever, that have that, you know, that pride about it, that they're going to work on their own stuff, but man, you've got to be careful. Yeah, I I mean, uh, I have this other saying, are you familiar with one called familiarity breeds contempt oh yeah okay and i keep that in the back of my mind and i also tell myself i could very well be that one out of one million freak occurrence like hey i just got my mower run into at approximately 40 miles per hour I never thought that could happen, but bloody hell, it sure did, didn't it, Ryan? So I don't think yeah. it's in the realm of impossibility, for example, for a moor that I had jacked up to look at fall back down on me. I, I, I don't put that out of the realm of possibility. I don't think, for example, that I have a, a car jacked up to look at its brakes that, oh, that jack's going to hold bullshit. I have jack stands and, you know, four by fours underneath holding it all up because I don't want to be that one in one million chance of of the shit actually hitting the fan. I agree. And you know who else agrees with you, Ray, about familiarity breeding contempt? Greg Allman and his six ex-wives. So there's also that. Greg Allman probably works on his own lawnmower. Maybe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought that joke would hit better, but it didn't. I, I'm, still, I'm gonna keep swinging, fellas. I'm so I was yeah, reading keep... forward. I was reading forward, and <laughs> it was not <laughs> in tune with the jokes that were. On. <laughs> like, I, was it? I did what? I did. Okay. okay. All right. Here. What? Did, let's dramatic. Anyway, let's go. Let's go ahead and move on with Pause. that because an 84 year old band died. And listen, why did I even put that in a burn? <laughs> Can I tell you a story about the time I almost died via a lawnmower one time? We already heard so, one of the ways you almost died before in the pre-show. If you're a Patreon member, by the way, you can hear that. Patreon.com oh yeah, forward slash burn return, right? Uh, so let's yeah, hear this, this in the live stream. nothing to do with Alprazolam. Um, I was mowing a, uh, a, a surround on a green one time, and I was in one of the Toro Sidewinders. Do you remember the Toro Sidewinder mm. that had the, the deck yes. that you yeah. could adjust? Still, still side. around. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Great, great mower. Um, Fantastic. it was wet and you know, it's like five 30 in the morning and it's dark outside and I've got lights on and I'm, um, I slid the deck all the way down, uh, down the hill close to this, uh, pond. Right. And I'm, so I'm trying to, trying to keep from weed eating the edge of this pond because, you know, I'm 19 years old or 20 years old and just lazy as hell. So. I get it down there and I'm mowing and my rear tires begin to slide and it slides off into the, uh, into the mud and it continues to just roll over and the roll cage saved me, right? Cause the roll cage is up and it kept me up in the air. If that roll cage wasn't there, the way I had fallen out of the seat because I wasn't wearing a seat belt, the steering wheel would have pinned me in about 15 inches of water, and I definitely would have drowned in that scenario. Uh, so lawnmowers are not to be taken lightly is the whole premise of that story. And yeah. 
Gentlemen, yeah, I mean, that's a report man facing assault charges over grass cutting in Girard. In Girard, Ohio, a man is facing an assault charge over what police say is an argument over grass cutting. Why do I see so many of those? If anybody follows the lawn care community on like Instagram or anything, these people are, are uh, oh, yeah, what is it? It's like a video TikTok? every week of like, yeah, yeah, I gotta mow this property that's got 18 inch grass. Like, that's every week there's somebody else doing a video on that. Or they're like, you You come four inches over my property line and I will kick your ass and set your house on fire. Uh, according to the report, a man was cutting his grass at his home at the 300 block of Powers Avenue on Friday evening when he was confronted by his neighbor who told him to get off his property. The man said he continued to walk away while cutting his grass and the neighbor, later identified as 61-year-old Terry, Terry Sackman, grabbed the man by the neck and began choking the shit out of him, the report said. When police questioned Sekman, he told him that his neighbor, uh, he told his neighbor to stay off his property and that he would cut his own damn grass, but that he never assaulted him. Police noted the victim had cuts and scratches on his neck, the report stated. Also, a witness told police that she saw Sekman choking the shit out of the victim. Sekman was issued a summons for assault. He's expected in a court here shortly. <laughs> Somebody hey. needs to take a chill pill. I'm one to speak. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's why your neighbors are so far away you know this is uh this is two towns over from where i grew up boys this is literally a i don't know seven eight minute drive so very familiar with the area and uh i gotta say it doesn't shock me not one bit well, what's what's the uh, matter with people in that neighborhood ryan yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. why does this not it's, shock you because this is stunning to me I, you know this that? is this is a town. Uh, it's not. It's not a shithole or anything like that. It's. It's a town in uh, a really blue collar area, right? And mm -hmm. a lot of people there just have a chip on their shoulder. I mean, just for anything. I mean, something as small as this, and it's just the way it is. The way we grew up. The way. I mean, so I could see it. You know, you come on my property with your lawnmower. I'm gonna. Whatever you know and doesn't shock me that's all right like um matt what you, there's got to be something right down in tennessee mississippi right that if you saw it you'd be like hey that's just the price of admission right there boys if you want to live down in down in sec country right <laughs> yes um I, you know for instance if you live in knoxville and you're an alabama fan for instance, right? You know, people are going to... They have those? Yes, they're down here. And, uh, and people will write obscenities on your cars. Um, and it's just <laughs> the price of being an Alabama fan in ball country. You know what I mean? So I, I get it. I guess when you phrase it that way, I'm much more understanding of the situation. See? See? Get it. Ray, you know, when... Okay, Ray, let me put it in context. Maybe you understand. You've got a nice fine turf lawn right and then using your words not mine the filipinos from the next door neighbor come over to turn their zero turn on your lawn or something like that you probably get an itchy and i don't want to say trigger finger that's maybe a little bit strong but you know you might walk want up a to bit? Him a pair of bra bra brass knuckles or a logging <laughs> chain or maybe a <laughs> uh rock and a sock you know even something like that i can see all those things oh, happening, man. right Oh man, you, Ryan. How well do you actually know me? <laughs> well enough that you'd be kind of, well enough that the walk and the sock would be the last bet. But you know, maybe just some medieval <laughs> torture devices or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to tee you up for some death talk, Ray. <laughs> but the the whole thing on that one is is that I don't. Uh, I don't get the whole nastiness and orneriness because uh, I know here in Hawaii, believe it or not, that wouldn't work very well. And you know why that wouldn't work very well, Ryan? Lay it on me. It's because, you know, these so-called ornery people, they always inevitably meet up with somebody bigger than they are who has nothing to lose by stomping the crap out of them. <laughs> and it literally does happen here in Hawaii. 
where you have some ornery, you know, somebody that says something to the wrong person and that person proceeds to just stomp the crap out of them. I mean, assault and battery is a very common uh, thing on people's rap sheets here. Super common. I don't know about y'all, but let's. <laughs> I have <laughs> one more article in the Burns, and uh, I'm doing some. Uh, this is typically the stuff we talk about off the air, but I'll just go ahead and do it on the air. Um, that was actually a supporting article to one of the earlier articles. So uh, we'll go ahead and move on to this week's positive returns. Gentlemen, drones could help we control weeds in hard to reach areas on golf courses. This is out of TurfNet. Uh, with elevation changes approaching triple digits, Ledge Rock Golf Club has an, an abundance of breathtaking views. However, getting any kind of equipment, especially a spray rig on those same high steep slopes, can be quite the challenge. Throw in the requisite labor shortages faced by just about every golf course from coast to coast. We've heard that before. It does not take long for the weeds to take over most hard to reach places on the 2006 Reese Jones design near Reading, Pennsylvania. But what they have found out is drones, my friend, drones. A conversation with a friend in the agriculture uh, industry yielded a potential solution using a drone to spray those areas where traditional rigs cannot go. While golf courses around the country have struggled to find enough help, what they have found is that they can use drones. Labor's the big thing. So if we can introduce a drone and save on labor, then let's get it done. Uh, I didn't see specifically which one they're using here, but what they did uh, specify is that the operator flies the drone five feet above the surface at five gallons per acre. The operator covered the entire two acre area in two flights and tree cover makes reaching some of the areas, even by air, impossible. But still the alert of spraying the areas where hand applications are difficult, if not impossible enough, enough to warrant the procedure. Here we go, boys. Let's let's automate it to the air. You know what, Matt? That works fine and good. However, I'm wondering how that golf course got through the FAA. Because right now, the FAA has basically tied up aerial application by drones bureaucratically. Because, you know what, Matt? I could use a spray drone carrying four or five gallons myself. I could use it. And because guess what I occasionally have to treat? Rock faces? Sea walls? I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yes, exactly. Rock faces. Rock faces, uh, you know, areas, agricultural areas that are too steep to grow conventional crops, those become grazed areas for livestock here in Hawaii, right? And I need to be able to do weed control on those kind of areas. And right now, guess how I'm doing those areas? I'm hiking them with the engine-driven backpack. Jeez, and, on Pete's, right? Yeah. And I'm also... I have the, the sprayer refitted with what's called a drizzle nozzle. And what that is, is that's a fine straight stream orifice that is designed to broadcast maybe 10 gallons per acre. Ray's out there doing bud tra buds training. You know, like he's about to go in the seals. Here's, here's one of these from this company that they're using, Ray. Mm-hmm. DJI has uh, one now too. If I recall yeah. correctly, there, yeah, so DJI. Somebody asked, somebody asked how how much volume they carry. The biggest one I've found so far is two point six gallons, right? You're yeah, spraying that's about five uh, gallons. Of the ten acre, liters. So you got to, yeah. So you got to come back and fill up. There was one that was twenty liters. Let me look at this again. Uh, I have seen them as cheap as uh, fifteen thousand. Thir the, I've the seen them for entry level DJI is thirteen. Yeah, entry well, level. I've seen other I've seen other brands of uh, 
spray drones from China start at about uh, ten thousand uh, dollars, you know, for the whole setup. Not well, DJI. The other thing I trust that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, the other thing there too is like what these guys are using. They're using real time kinematics, right? So they're using ultra precise GPS. You're going to have a fee associated with that, like a subscription fee of a thousand to two thousand a year just to to have that capability yeah so hey it's a great idea i think is the future there i think for some places right like there, there's definitely some stuff there but like you said ray like uh, there's so much regulatory stuff and overlapping between so many different agencies there that boy once they get a hold of it yeah. it's gonna yeah, either it's a bureauc- be a very short it's gonna be a short time span and they're going to come up with something really really stupid right or it'll be tied up so long that nobody wants to piss it just doesn't move on the next thing yeah it just doesn't happen because by the way here's how i ended up uh basically hiking along rock faces is i wanted to send this landowner to go contract with the guys that used to spray the sugarcane fields by helicopter but by the time you know, his need came up. Uh, that company left Hawaii already because all of the sugarcane fields were gone. So I couldn't send him over to hey, get that helicopter guy to drop some uh, NSM and 24D on your brush, which is exactly what I'm using right now. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of robots. The Ohio Department of Transportation is the latest of the list of DOTs that are now employing remote control flailbot mowers in Summit and Stark. I think we saw this on a previous episode of another Department of Transportation mm-hmm. introducing these. And now Ohio has stepped up to the plate and said, damn it, let's get it done. Run on diesel and control remotely by an operator to cut grass and bush in steep areas that can't be reached by tractors. Three remote control flail bot mowing machines are now used by the Ohio Department of Transportation's District 4. We're out there three or four times a week, pretty much getting behind the mowers and then getting those hillsides. We try to get those hillsides three or four times a year if we have to. Uh, it's kind of a relatively new thing here in District 4. We purchased these ro- remote control slope mowers in 2019 for Ashtabula County, then two more last year for Summit and Stark Counties. It says each machine is comparable in price to a tractor and batwing mower commonly seen being used on roadsides. The machines are used to mow on hillsides where it would be too dangerous, if not impossible, to be, put a conventional tractor due to the risk of rollover. Now, all of a sudden, the operator can stand off-road away from traffic when the device is mowing along a highway or an on-ramp. Here we go, boys. Here we go. They say it's a little bit more work, but a lot less work. I don't know what that means. A bit more work uh, than driving a mowing tractor, but a lot less work than the old way of handling difficult areas. Ah, there we go. You know, Matt, I'm curious to know how much that uh, track that robotic tractor costs because eighty thousand. Do you know eighty thousand? Eighty thousand. That's cheap. You know why I say that's cheap? Guess what the overhead is for. A crew of four people string trimming 40 hours a week for a year is. Guess what the overhead oh. is? Notwithstanding the workers' comp insurance on that is no, going to no, be sky in, high. Including the workers' comp, including the workers' comp, over a hundred thousand per year. Oh, easily. Over a hundred. Easily. Over a hundred grand per year, and in the meantime. Do you know what happens to people that run string trimmers seven seven hours a day? Do you know what typically happens to them? It's real easy for them to give themselves a stranger. No, they all they all get carpal tunnel syndrome. Oh, I just think numb hands and you know. No, they they, they, they get carpal tunnel syndrome and worse things, and it's like, <laughs> Lord have mercy on them if. They should fall off of that steep incline as well. <laughs> you know, Lord have mercy. So, you know, I can see hey. th- this is where a robot is a good fit. You know, this is where a robotic mower is a super good fit. Right here. Get that on tape. Get that on tape. Ray just caved. 
He gave in to the terrorists. You hear that? So um, <laughs> there's there's a lot of value here, a lot of value here. And the one thing too, Ray, on that safety thing is that uh, here the state. Department of Workers' Compensation, the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, has actually been giving out grants every year, and they'll match you up to three to one, right? So for that eighty thousand, these guys might have been able to get away with it for, like, maybe twenty five thousand, right? A little bit more. Mm-hmm. And the state, the state picked up yeah. the rest of the tab. So that's just because of you know less workplace, you know, accidents or risk of accidents, things like that. Like they're willing to cough up the money. And grant you that opportunity to do that so they don't have to push a bunch of paper. Yeah, well, that, that just all makes total sense to me because the other common injury uh, is guess what happens to people that fall off of that embankment and right into oncoming traffic? Because, by the way, <laughs> Jesus okay, Ryan, you know what I notice? All wow. of these people that are wow. sh- string trimming on these on these steep embankments, guess what I don't Boy, see on them? I was going to say a shovel to clean up the brain matter from the road. I don't know, right? <laughs> no, no, I don't see them harnessed or tethered with fall protection. Oh, no. No. no, okay. I mean, that's they're gonna, gonna they're on. Now. No, they're on these exte- extremely steep, steep embankments and zero fall protection. Okay, none. I, hey, I agree, <laughs> and I'm just saying that some of these areas, right? I'll be anxious to see what the limits of this particular machine and others like it will be, um, and how far they can push it, right? Because the other thing here is here's going to be the flip side of this, right? You know, you just talked about the overhead of a crew of four. You're going to have people that come in and say, and I know these guys are a union shop. They're going to say, hey, you're stealing jobs. Get rid of the robots. It's going to happen. Like there will be grievances filed and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's going to be an interesting thing, too, to see. They're the, already the short staffed. Struggle. They're already short staffed. And they'll you still know do what? it. You know what? There are people out there that get injured doing this every day. Speaking of injured people who are trying to figure out what to do in life, we've got a very uplifting story here of a local pitcher for a Diamondbacks affiliate because we all know the single and double A Major League Baseball is all about. I don't know where I'm going with that. And they have a lawn mowing side job to get by. Here we go out of Rockland. His day job is pitching for the Aaron, uh, Arizona Diamondbacks single A affiliate mowing down batters, but Rockland Scott Randall also has a side job offering to mow your yard. He told us about his unusual changeup. It's a pow. After being drafted by Arizona in this year's MLB draft, Randall's road to making the major league ball club is starting in the single A minor leagues. leagues. But until he is there, it is not a road of riches. The pay is just kind of being able to live out your dream. Randall earns about $500 a week on his minor league contract, which means people who live in his Rockland neighborhood can now get a smoking good deal. He's mowing lawns this fall season during his baseball off season. So being able to be, uh, being able to me just post something on next door and just easily, I got 30 comments on the post just within a day and I'm filled up for two weeks with mowing. Randall posted his job offer on next door, and people who want to see a pro pitcher work in their yard can now pay for one. Gentlemen, we've got housewives all across uh, this area of Arizona absolutely falling out to have this uh, this young, strapping, handsome man come sweat his ass off and mow their yard. I can only yeah, can imagine see. what kind of filthy things take place here. Do you think... That- <laughs> Do you think they pay him an extra 20 bucks to mow in his baseball pants? You know, his cleats? Hey, uh, sir. Can you put your stirrups on, too? Yeah, uh, sir, uh, <laughs> do you mind rolling around in the dirt first and then coming to mow the yard? <laughs> I love a, a man that's just hardworking, dirty, in uniform, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> My husband drives a truck, and if you could get here between 9.30 and 11 in the morning, that'd be great. Of a hotel yep. key this party man should be renamed. He should be renamed the divorce, right? Because 
seriously, how many how many marriages is this guy out here wrecking? I'm just curious. <laughs> enough, enough. I mean, uh, because, family court won't uh, care. Yeah, because you always, uh, you know, you always make jokes about me, but uh, rule number one is uh, not with somebody else's wife. <laughs> Okay, that, that's that, my number uh, one rule that I that I follow. That's that, that's that's a good company policy, there, right? What was that movie? Yeah. Um, back in the eighties, "Can't Buy Me Love," right? Yes. The dude mowed lawns, but then he killed her. The pizza it was an a pizza with anchovies, right? That was the code word, Ray. So, mm -hmm. is, is, I mean, you ever have anybody try to order a pizza with anchovies with your your services? Nope. 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 <laughs> nope. Nope. I mean, uh, thankfully, did, no. But, I mean, well, it was a little bit different. <laughs> I did. I did. I had a, I had a, I had a creepy old guy come to the door. <laughs> naked. You. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Oops. Well, oops. You know oops what? I rock. forgot. Uh, I've forgotten to put my okay. jockeys on. <laughs> yeah. You know what? You know what? The, he told me he couldn't How, hear. That's his... why he needed me to come inside. He's hard of hearing, so just come in, and I'll have the check right here when you come in. He failed to mention the fact that he would be there unclothed, doing something horrific to himself as I came through the front door to just collect the check after doing a front and side application for like $30, $40. Did you get really you know what? I... No, I, I had to... I had to judo flip this... <laughs> <laughs> you know, ex Navy man, because he was reaching for me in a certain oh way. Oh boy. Yeah. I once had to do that. I mean, it was just okay. the, the creepiest, shittiest thing. And you know what? You know what's even more creepy? Imagine judo flipping an ex navy man, not much. Okay, creepiest and weirdest thing is okay, when that happened, you know, 20 years ago, I literally looked like a 10 year old boy. Oh, boy. Okay, yeah, I literally looked like a twin, like, 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 a ten, like a 10 year old boy back then. So it's like, why? And so it's like, oh my goodness! It's like, don't tell me that this guy's also into little kids or something. It's like, you, <laughs> you. Well, hey, you know what? The, tonight I learned that uh, I am not a very good-looking individual, but you two gentlemen are healthy, desirable studs. All right, <laughs> you should be proud of it. <laughs> Speaking of studs, gentlemen, <laughs> let's check out what we got going on in the mailbag. Yeah, you've got mail. So, uh, and the reason why I say this is, is that this person alluded to me being turf truth, which just, if we haven't covered it once, we've covered it a thousand times. Absolutely chaps my ass. He said, hey guys, I was watching turf truth, AKA Matt Martin hmm. <laughs> and got confused on a matter. He mentioned that being that an 18, 24, 12 or starter fertilizer, many landscapers or homeowners do after fall aeration and seeding. Is this not best practice and why? Who wants to go first? The question is, is this is, is this not best practice? Yes. Uh, okay. I would say it's not best practice to do it. You know, why do people do it? Because they, you know, phosphorus, germination, you know, seed establishment, all this and that. Do you absolutely need to do it? And this is where, I know Matt and I might differ a little bit, but you don't need to do it if you have adequate phosphorus. In the in the realm of, hey, I'm going to be damn sure that I get this stuff up and going, a little bit of pee out there, not the end of the world, right? So in my mind, um, and I've seen, I tried to go look for a slide that I thought was really good that our boy, Michael Woods, put out there a long time ago. This is like a retweet that he had. But it's a pretty good study on um a pretty good data on ryegrass and I think Kentucky blue both that showed that if there was adequate soil pea that 
increasing the rate right of over and above that with fertilizer applications made no difference in the overall establishment of that turf so i'll see if i can dig that up and share it at some point it's a couple years old i'll have to just scroll through his timeline but i don't know where are you guys at on this you go ahead ray you know as a rule i have no special hang-ups or problems with a one-time application of phosphorus to newly established turf or turf that's under reno but here's my big butt or catch does this person even know whether he even needs it or not okay that's, that's my big catch because like i know the other day we kind of got called out for recommending you know a fertilization program for somebody but you noticed how when i was talking about fertilizers with this person not once did i mention phosphorus potassium or micronutrients even i just kept it at various sources of nitrogen right you know i, I be, and and that's something that i basically follow myself is that until i know I will mostly stick to a nitrogen only application. And once I do know, then all bits are off. I go ham. Um, I'm r right there with you. So, and, you know, just to kind of reinforce this, you know, I don't think it's any secret. Jay Pink and I have been, you know, doing a little renovation on a guy's yard and he had adequate, eh, a little, tiny bit low, but pretty much adequate soil phosphorus and, uh, did not use a starter fertilizer. In fact, didn't use any fertilizer during establishment and it came in great, fine, all that fun stuff. And then fertilize it without pee and it is doing exactly like it should at the rate that it should. So why is it generalized as not a best practice is because that there are inherent risks with applying fertilizer. So if you don't know whether or not you need it, then it would make sense that the safest play is to not apply it. Uh, because it's only in rare circumstances that you would ever run into an issue off the bat during establishment of not having enough phosphorus. So if you want to be extremely careful, if you want to be careful, if you want to follow best management practices, BMPs, we call it within the industry, then you would either have that tested first or not apply phosphorus until you have some sort of definitive answer over whether or not you need it. Simple as that. I got there it. There you go. There, there you, you go. go. Gentlemen, yeah, you got it. I want to thank all of y'all for uh, being here today, especially since it's on a Saturday. Um, and uh, and all, also, shit, let's go ahead and prep everybody for what we've got coming up on Thursday, Thursday this week. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we've got Dave, who is a pro applicator, uh, who's about to launch a company called the Bluegrass Buddha. And he wants to maximize his time on nice. each, yard, each yard, and he is exploring various slow-release nitrogen options, including maybe even the concept of only doing a one-and-done type application when it comes hmm. to fertility. So we've got a lot to unpack here. It's going to be a super in-depth, uh, kind of, I mean, maybe not complex in the sense of like all-encompassing, but complex in the sense of just discussing nitrogen. So I'm super excited about that. We get one topic that we really get to hammer down on and explore a hundred different options related to it because it can be one of the most critical parts of fertilizer management. Gentlemen, thank you all for tuning in. We'll catch y'all on Thursday.